Um, let me begin by welcoming everyone to our special event today. I am Paul Betts, the director of the European Studies Center and a member of the History Department. And on behalf of the European Studies Center and the college, it is my great privilege this morning to, to welcome you to this conference on Brexit, you looking at me, looking at you, Brexit, Britain, and the world. Now, as you may know, St. Anthony's was founded in the early 1950s with the express aim of studying contemporary global problems and is composed of various regional study centers whose student body is the most international of all the Oxford colleges. This conference is very much in keeping with the spirit of the college's approach to current affairs. Our European Study Center celebrated its 40th anniversary last spring. The center is just 100 yards down the road and was founded in 1976 with a generous donation uh, gift from the Volkswagen Foundation. Originally, it was called the Western European Studies Center and was dedicated to studying the problems confronting contemporary Western Europe from an interdisciplinary perspective. And in those days, the focus was mostly on British West, Europe, uh, West German relations. With the end of the Cold War, our center not surprisingly dropped the West uh, from its name so as to signal its commitment to the study of Europe as a whole and the whole of Europe. Over the decades, ESC has played host to sustained academic inquiry, uh, scholarly exchange, and a range of visiting, visiting fellows from across the continent. And as you can imagine, we've been very busy since last spring with numerous events dedicated to discussing uh, European identity and its borders, the sustainability of its common currency, and the mission of political union, the refugee crisis, and of course, the faded referendum. This conference looks to take up many of these issues in new ways, and the subject of Brexit could not be more timely or pressing. I would like to thank Adam Bennett, uh, David Vines, and Julie Adams for the great work in putting this together, and would like to welcome you all to the conference and hope that you will enjoy the conference itself. At this point, I will turn things over to David Vines, who will then uh, provide a conference introduction. So, David. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to this meeting. We had a similar meeting a year ago, uh, but we had no idea that a year later there would be the need to have a meeting of this kind. A year ago we had a meeting on the future of Europe and it wasn't an optimistic meeting but I think nobody really imagined that we'd be now where we are. It seemed obvious that we should do it again and it's very great pleasure to welcome you all here to this gathering. The Political Economy of Financial Markets program was set up five years ago by Max Watson, uh, a, a friend and colleague of many of us. I had known him for some years beforehand in his connection with Oxford, but Max had one of those remarkable British civil service careers, except that it began at the Bank of England rather than into the civil service. First Bank of England, then International Monetary Fund, and then uh, five years, there's Klaus Regling's advisor, senior advisor at the European Commission, and then to Oxford. Uh, his time at, uh, as Klaus Regling's advisor was a wonder to all of us, since he had been Klaus's boss at the IMF and went to Brussels to work for Klaus uh, for the European Commission. They were a very interesting pair, and when both had retired from that work, they then did the most important report on that Irish financial crisis in 2009-10. Uh, you'll see that the program has been enormously active in the last five years, simply by looking at the most recent newsletter, which is on the table, and I hope all of you have picked it up along with your program. And on the back page, you will see just what an active year last year was, and the last few We'll just wait for Nora to find her phone. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> each year, we have had a stream of interesting activities of this kind. The year before, this, the, the, the meeting on the future of Europe was in Trinity term last year. And the year before that, we had a very interesting meeting with Klaus Gregling and a number of very senior European policymakers thinking about the future of the Eurozone. So, this group of people 
has gone on doing really very interesting activities during this period of five years. We're hoping now to take it forward with a continuing work on the uh, follow-up to an endless ongoing follow-up to the financial crisis of 2008, but adding to that work uh, some work on the restoring the trustworthiness of the financial system, but also to understand the relationship between the financial system and the populism which has become so important in Europe, the US and in so many places. It's a huge pleasure to me now to turn to welcome our two keynote speakers. Let me say a few words about both of them uh, rather than individually and explain to you how we'll proceed. Each of them will uh, speak for nearly half an hour and then we have 20 minutes of question and answers. I'd be very happy, and I, I hope they will too, if when Adam, who speaks first, has finished, anyone has some questions about interpretation that they want to ask him, but we'll lay, leave the real Q&A until after Anora has spoken when we'll talk about both of them. Uh, it's a great pr privilege to see the two of them sitting uh, here uh, together since they were consecutively president of the British Academy and uh, it's rather nice to uh, see that. Uh, Adam uh, was one of those people who welcomed me as an outsider to Oxford. I still think of myself as a newcomer although I've now been here 25 years. When I first arrived uh, I found it very difficult to understand how Oxford worked. Uh, I still find it very difficult, as everyone does, to understand how Oxford worked uh, and works. Uh, Adam was one of those people who helped me begin to understand this. Uh, in looking at his uh, CV on Wikipedia, I discover that long ago um, Adam was an assistant editor at Peace News. And that's not a publication that I know very much about. <coughs> it, does it still exist? Curiously, it does, yes. Really? Yes. Well, that was the, that, it seems, was the beginning of what Adam did. Uh, but he was at the LSE, and then for many years, uh, the Montague Burton Professor of uh, International Relations here in Oxford. Uh, and it's been a, a real pleasure to get to know him through Balliol where we've both been for ever since this newcomer arrived in Oxford 25 years ago. Uh, Anora Neal is someone who I have to say I got to know through Adam. When I had begun some work on uh, restoring the trustworthiness of the financial system, uh, I of course, wanted to talk to Anora, having read her Reith lectures about trustworthiness. And it was Adam who initially put me in touch with her. But to just give you some idea of uh, the sort of experience that I think many people have, have and have had with Anora, having been to meet her <coughs> once at her house to talk about some work we were doing, she invited my colleague Nick Morris, who's here this morning with, with us, back for a second time to discuss some particular aspects of the work and ended up volunteering to contribute a chapter to the book that we were doing on trustworthiness and finance. And, and I, I, I have a feeling that this fact uh, partly helped uh, Anora becoming an expert in the financial system and uh, be becoming a member of the Banking Standards Board, which she now is and to which she's bringing her insights uh, about trustworthiness into very complicated world of finance. So having said that as a way of welcome to both of them, I wonder if you could join me in welcoming them, both of them and then over to you, Adam. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, David was kind enough to um, mention one aspect of my misspent youth. Uh, and uh, there is something I learned from it which um, is highly germane to what I'm about to say. 
Um, and that is, uh, in my short period working for Peace News that you mentioned, I came rapidly to the conclusion that it's no use opposing a defence policy if you don't have any clear idea of what you would put in its place. And um, you can see the carryover to the issue uh, of Brexit, uh, the uh, need for clarity as to what is to be in place of our membership of the uh, European Union. And that is uh, my central theme today, and indeed the central purpose of this meeting. Um, uh, helpfully, uh, uh, David and others have outlined the questions before us, how the UK expects its relationship with Europe to change, and how the UK hopes to engage with the rest of the non-European world, and how the world might respond to this European divorce. And then there's even a fourth question, but that is to some extent postponed for the London follow-up. Now, um, in trying to answer these questions, I think we've got to be careful not to assume more intellectual coherence, clarity of purpose, or plain common sense than there actually is in addressing <coughs> this question. At least we should keep an open mind on this. I am extremely sceptical, and I'll be frank with you about this, um, about whether the Brexit campaign can or will result in a strong and stable set of proposals uh, about Britain's place in the world. Indeed, it's another theme of my remarks. Uh, I fear there's a danger that we may find ourselves in the unwelcome role of being a negative example, a case of how a member state should not handle its dissatisfactions with the European Union. At the same time, I believe that there are many criticisms to be made of the pro-European position, and I'll come to them uh, at the end of my remarks. Maybe we need to view the whole story in a very different light from that in which it's conventionally analysed. Um, Calypso Nicolaides, who is here, there she is, um, has memorably... Uh, in this college, talked, interpreted the entire story in terms of Exodus, the biblical wanderings of the chosen people, reckoning and sacrifice, and in terms, if not biblical, uh, also uh, from Greek mythology. And one crumb, uh, crumb of comfort that can be derived from this tour de force that she delivered in this college uh, is she reassured us that not every grand myth of sacrifice kills its victims. Um, now, it would be easy for me to focus these remarks simply on a condemnation of the Brexit campaign. There were shockingly widespread lies in the campaign, and they can only be called lies. Um, now, it's nothing new in international relations. One mustn't pretend that international relations was lie-free before. Um, here, if I may, I'll quote from a, a statement made by European heads of government and state. This is the first sentence of a formal document that they issued, informed of the rumours, as extravagant as they are false, which the malevolence of some and the credulity of others has conspired to spread, uh, that was uh, a statement made in 1820 at the Congress of Troppau. So uh, complaints of lies are certainly nothing new. And we all know uh, what some of them were. Uh, the three fifty million pounds a week paraded on the bus and in every leaflet of the uh, uh, Brexit campaign. Uh, to me, as a student of international relations, the most extraordinary and shocking lie was the pretense that Turkey was on the verge of joining the European Union. 
the fact that it had been involved in negotiations uh, for membership of the European Union, we all knew, didn't mean that it was just about to join. And yet it was willfully so interpreted. Uh, and uh, the other day I was having lunch in a pub in the Chilterns with an Indian friend uh, who lives in, lived, long lived in the UK, who voted Brexit. I asked him what the decisive factor was in his case, and he said uh, impending Turkish membership of NATO and the immigration that would follow from that. Some people did believe uh, uh, that um, as a, a, a scenario. And indeed, a minister of the Crown, uh, Penny Mordaunt, junior defence minister, actually said that there was no control whatever in Britain over Turkish membership. The fact that our parliament and 27 other parliaments would have been able to veto it, um, any one of them, uh, was uh, something that this Minister of the Crown was uh, completely unaware of. Now, uh, I could go on with my indignation about the role of the Daily Mail, uh, which, among other things, played Turkey for all it was worth, um, about the extraordinary story of the influencing of voters by the efforts of Robert Mercer, an American citizen and a hedge fund billionaire, um, and uh, Steve Bannon, uh, and Cambridge Analytica, a company with which he's associated, and another one, Aggregate IQ, in doing an extraordinarily uh, extensive analysis of UK voters, leading to pressure on them to change their minds. Now, the missing link in that story is we don't know the extent to which minds were actually changed by that campaign. But what is clear is that there was a huge hidden election expenditure um, which escaped the strictures of the law. Um, and one could go on also about some faults on the other side, the way in which Project Fear uh, presented an almost exclusively economic case for the European Union, not addressing the extraordinary contribution that the European Union has made towards uh, peace uh, in uh, Europe. Um, now, it would also be possible uh, to deliberate at length upon the limits of referenda. Uh, I'm leery about getting into constitutional matters now. Later today we will hear from Vernon Bogdanov, who knows a great deal more about them than I do. Um, but I can't resist making one wry observation. As a former constituent of the um, Islington South and Finsbury parliamentary constituency, I had an MP, George Cunningham, who at the time of the 1978 referendum in Scotland uh, managed to get Parliament to agree that it wouldn't be enough to pass devolution if there was a bare majority uh, in favour of it in uh, Scotland. There had also to be 40% of the electorate voting uh, for it. And in the event, uh, the vote was uh, only 32.9% of the electorate, uh, and it failed, although it was a majority of those voting. So uh, the rule that he had suggested and got passed through Parliament, that if you're making a major constitutional change, there needs to be some decent proportion of the electorate supporting it, was one that was not implemented uh, in the recent referendum, if it had been, it would have failed. It got 38% of the electorate. Now, I mention all these gripes um, because I think that when a project begins on as dubious and questionable a basis as the Leave project has, uh, one should expect there to be continuing turbulence about it and that there certainly will be. 
And um, in the literature, as I mentioned, they suggested there was no clarity about what exactly was being suggested. There was reassurance that we would be like Switzerland. That was mentioned in all the Leave UK uh, uh, literature. Uh, and as you know, Switzerland has a special relationship with Europe being part of the um, single market, single Euro the European single market, but not a full member of the European uh, Union. And uh, so it was made to sound a reassuring project. Uh, and yet, since the referendum, and I suspect influenced somewhat by the press, uh, it has been treated, the, the result has been treated as a mandate for a complete break with Europe. And Theresa May, for example, has famously said uh, in her Lancaster House speech that she was not in favour of Britain uh, remaining in the European single market, although she went on to indicate terms that didn't sound terribly different from the European single market. But that's one of the issues that we need to uh, discuss uh, today. Now, having got this off my chest, I now want to say that there is a danger among us all of simplifying the result of the referendum and losing sight of some of the fundamental factors that were undoubtedly involved. And uh, the deeper common causes of Brexit and, to some extent, Trumpism as well, are first of all the deep dissatisfaction which of course is stronger in some areas than others, with the effects of globalisation. Uh, and among other things, the effects of globalisation have been to make it extremely hard, if not possible, for workers to strike for higher wages, because there's always a risk of them being undercut, their product being uh, undercut. Um, the huge resentment at wealth differentials is another factor that was undoubtedly fed into the uh, uh, referendum result, and in particular, the way in which uh, we had still been expected to uh, engage in uh, restraint to suffer economically, while uh, the bankers who had been responsible for the collapse got off scot-free or even with vast uh, public subsidies. And uh, some of you will remember in this college Paul Nolter's memorable lecture uh, earlier this year uh, when he spoke on imaginary invalids, the Euro Atlantic populations, and the crisis of democracy. He highlighted the extent of socio economic change which had left many people feeling threatened or left out of the party in one way or another. He highlighted loss of jobs and status, racial uh, uh, difficulties, uh, the haste with which new forms of gender uh, equality and respect had been introduced, LGBT, and all of that. Um, and he, su he suggested that the problem was essentially the pace of change and especially so uh, with immigration, the feeling that it was out of control. Um, another factor that I think helps to explain the referendum result, it was not a main contributing factor, but it set the scene was the failure of military interventions in which governments have engaged in the uh, post-Cold War period. Um, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, etc. And one of the effects of that is to diminish respect for government as such if it is seen to be making 
decisions that are faulty. And in particular, there is a problem here with liberalism and the international spread of liberal ideas, which seems, in all the three countries I've mentioned, to have run into troubles of various uh, kinds. So there was another issue that explains why both in the United States and in the United Kingdom there has been this extraordinary revolt, this departure from the centre ground. And of course that has contributed to a mood of rather narrow nationalism, a belief that you look after your own and don't get involved in needless adventures uh, overseas. And one of the side effects of that frame of mind is a dislike or distrust of international uh, organisations. Um, now, against this background, I'm struck at how incoherent much of the public debate and many of the governmental statements about Brexit have actually been. Um, we did memorably have Boris Johnson saying that the UK would make a titanic success of Brexit. Um, not perhaps the most uh, fortunate adjective to have used in the circumstances. Um, it seems to me self-evident that the Brexit negotiations will be extremely difficult for five solid reasons. One, trade negotiations as a genre of negotiation tend to be long drawn out and difficult. And the big, there are very big stakes in these negotiations. 44% of what we sell abroad goes to the European Union. And it's interesting, there isn't quite a parallelism there Something like 8% of what the European Union exports overall comes to the UK. So we've got, in a sense, more to worry about in these uh, negotiations than the European Union. Secondly, it is not obvious why the European Union uh, should want to make withdrawal easy when they wish to discourage further disintegration of the European Union. It simply isn't, to me, it's not a matter of wishing to punish us, but clearly if it was possible to leave the European Union with no penalties at all, and uh, with uh, the right to make trade deals with other countries as we choose, at the same time as having free market free trade exchange with the European Union, clearly other countries might be sorely tempted by that uh, uh, delightful prospect. And you can't, one shouldn't be surprised uh, that the European Union uh, is unlikely to make quite such a generous offer as that, even forgetting the number of um, uh, somewhat petulant remarks with a uh, framework of, of British approaches to the European Union. And, uh, I'm struck at the mixture of um, treating the problem as easy, Boris Johnson saying the Italians will want to be selling us their cava, so uh, uh, there's no problem, um, uh, to treating Europe as uh, something to be patronised as with uh, Theresa May's proposal <coughs> that Britain could be a bridge between the European Union and the United States. Uh, deeply patronising and uh, uh, not, thank God, uh, repeated. <laughs> um, the uh, third reason why these negotiations can be expected to be difficult is that the European Union's insistence on agreeing of the divorce bill first before negotiating trade terms will lead to politically a politically explosive situation in the UK. Who will control the narrative on this? 
It'd be an interesting dinner party exercise to write the headline for the Daily Mail about this. But uh, European jailers demand billion dollar ransom, billion euro ransom for uh, our freedom is the sort of thing that we can uh, expect. It seems to me it's going to be a very, very ugly uh, negotiation before we pass that first hurdle. Um, fourthly, ruling out membership of the European single market, I already mentioned the Lancaster House speech, seems to me to be something that makes the negotiation quite problematic. Um, but Theresa May did add, so an important part of the new strategic partnership we seek with the EU will be the pursuit of the greatest possible access to the single market on a fully reciprocal basis through a comprehensive free trade agreement. So it's not obvious that that's very different from what we had. And then fifthly, a fifth reason why the negotiations will be very difficult is one which I will leave to Honora O'Neill to address, uh, which is the effects within the United Kingdom, both within Scotland, which uh, I suppose I could say a word about, uh, and, Northern, and Ireland, which is uh, what an honourable will concentrate on. Um, Scotland does seem to me to be a very difficult case, where the departure from the Union, uh, from the European Union, uh, provides Scotland with a very strong temptation to stay in the European Union, and that means independence. And no doubt there will at some stage be a vote, a referendum on this, and it's very hard to predict the outcome. Um, now, I'll conclude by saying just a quick word about where I think liberal ideas need to be rethought. There has been a danger of a kind of liberal arrogance, of assuming, for example, that because there, was, there were so many lies told in the referendum campaign, therefore the voters were acting out of false consciousness. And liberals end up risking sounding like latter-day Marxists in uh, assuming that the people didn't know what they were doing. Uh, and it's not at all self-evident to me that that is the case for the uh, majority of those who actually voted, and certainly it'd be unwise to patronise them and to treat them as uh, uh, having voted out of ignorance. We certainly need a much better debate about immigration than we have had, and it has been a weakness of liberal political theory as well as uh, political practice that there hasn't been uh, a debate uh, which, in, in my view, needs to lead to a conclusion not unlike that of Canada, where, on the one hand, immigration is welcome, but on the other hand, it is very firmly controlled with targets set. Uh, and uh, the result has been that immigration is not the politically explosive issue in Canada uh, that it is um, elsewhere. I also think there's a danger in liberal world-weary pessim world pessimism in uh, the current crisis, uh, a feeling that it's all going wrong. But when you think about the lack of coherence of the Brexit position, or equally of Trumpism in the United States, it's far from self-evident <laughs> that liberalism is in really serious trouble. There may well be a rebound precisely because these are not coherent doctrines. And we see daily evidence of how there is a lack of coherence, uh, and a lack of political savoir faire in the White House. And the Brexit campaign is not so very different. Indeed, it was heartening to see in the recent French elections that one point that rather defeated the election um, manipulators, the, the uh, Steve Bannons of this world, was that they don't seem to have fully grasped that in order to have an influence on French elections, you have to use the French language. 
It's rather elementary, uh, but uh, uh, indeed the French elections, like the Dutch elections earlier this year in March, are evidence that a sort of fight back has begun and that it is far from self-evident that the lesson drawn from either Trump or Brexit will be one that will be followed uh, elsewhere. The EU, I'm not in doubt, will survive, and I don't think that's the issue before us. I think the issue before us is how to craft serious, uh, plausible policies for the UK in its future relationship with the European Union. And this conference seems to me to be right on the, on the money as far as that issue is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. You didn't mention a connection between Alan and myself, which might be even more surprising. We were undergraduates here together and have known one another for quite a long time. <laughs> uh, well, I like to imagine the organisers of today puzzling about the conference title because they hit upon the brilliant phrase, where now? The sort of thing you say when you're completely lost. And, of course, it is an apt title. So I'm going to say a little bit about where we are in process and then go on to the issues that most affect the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland and thereby the UK. Um, on the process, well, we know Article 50 is triggered and it is remarkable that we have this swirl of ill-tempered dogmatic assertion about what it means. Uh, that fuels where now is the question. The, uh, uh, to me, at present, the most significant substantive difference seems to be between those who think that uh, the, before there can be any substantive negotiations on future relations, some things have to be settled. So Barnier on the, April the 17th, to succeed we need on the contrary to devote the first phase of the negotiation to reaching an agreement on the principles of exit. Sounds okay until you think about it a bit, but three things were mentioned that must be settled in advance. Um, what the UK must pay the EU, what the situation of citizens living in other states will be, and what the situation of the Republic of Ireland will be. So, well, you could, if you're positive, say at least one of the constitutional issues is getting attention, which it did not in the referendum campaigns, where I think nobody thought that the vote had constitutional significance for the integrity of the UK. But, of course, at the other end of the spectrum, there are lots of people who think uh, that nothing can be agreed until everything's agreed, a rather standard proposition, which would mean that there could be no way of settling in advance of negotiation what the UK must pay, the situation of EU citizens working in other EU states, or the situation of the Republic of Ireland. Now, in these circumstances, I think it's increasingly clear that no deal is one of the likely outcomes. I believe there's more awareness of the no deal possibility uh, than there was a few months ago when most ministers seemed uh, to poo-poo the very possibility. Um, I think there's a very strong possibility because many EU states and companies have strong interests in securing uh, specific sorts of engagement and trading relationships with the EU, as enthusiasts suggest, surely true, but although that's true, the interests are dispersed. They're not shared by all member states or all companies. Indeed, some member states and some companies or economic interests will have interests in securing the exclusion of the UK or UK companies so that they don't have to compete. It makes good sense. They have an interest in there not being an agreement on certain matters. So I think there is a coordination problem of a size that is intimidating to think about uh, because the, uh, there is not clarity enough about shared purposes and interests. So in my view the no deal option, particularly given the time limit, has to be taken very seriously. In that context, how clear are people about what no deal means? 
a lot of possibilities have been mentioned. On some, if it's no deal, nothing's changed, we're still a member of the EU. I think that's not the case. On most views, the UK would have left the EU without an agreement, but then there's disagreement about whether WTO terms are the automatic default, since some think that UK membership of the WTO hinges on its relationship with the EU, so that a failed negotiation would not deliver WTO terms. I leave those questions to those of you with the right expertise, but I think it's striking that even if you're listening quite closely, it's difficult to see a clear answer. I'm now going to come to uh, the relations between the UK and the Republic of Ireland, on which there is surprisingly actually limited agreement already, but no detail, and the devil is really in the detail here. The so-called common travel area of the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, and also of various other islands which are not part of the UK, is a long-established and effective structure. Its continuation did become part of discussion in the UK and in the Republic last winter, to the relief of those of us who would thought it of first importance for a long time. I think the, the, the sort of point to remember is that the common travel area is an older and stronger degree of integration than the Schengen arrangements between some European countries. So let me say a little bit about what it is hiding, lurking under that phrase, common travel area. The relationship between citizenship, movement and borders within these islands dates from the 1920s. Before that, they'd been one state. It's stronger than Schengen because not merely are those of us who are citizens either of the Republic or of the UK entitled to move without passports, to work, to travel or to live in either country. We're also entitled to vote in whichever country we live in. And that is a pretty fundamental difference. It's why the Irish vote within parts of the UK has at many times been a potent political force. And it's why there is detailed coordination between the two states on immigration at present. Uh, that is, you may say it's not, uh, uh, doesn't work perfectly, but it, and it only works because they are both members of the EU, but there is that coordination. In short, the relation between the Republic and the UK is stronger, older, and deeper in our marrow in both countries than our relations with any other European states. And it's essential to the Irish economy that in hard times, unemployment in the Republic of Ireland, which can be huge, is buffered by many people working for a longer or shorter time in Britain, where, of course, they already have families, networks, cousins, places they can live while they work, and so on. That is one reason why Brexit is so threatening to the economy of the Republic of Ireland. It's not just the experts, the exports, though they are um, a serious matter. 14% of our Republic of Ireland exports come to the UK, and a large percentage of Republic of Ireland exports to the EU travel through the UK. Now, what are the realities here? In the former Soviet Union, they used to have a nice phrase, uh, near abroad. Well, I think the Republic of Ireland, for most of us living on this island, not all, but most, is not merely near abroad. It isn't really abroad. We not merely have history, which of course includes animosity, but we have law. We have a habit of working, moving, and traveling to and fro. And by the way, that's not just from Northern Ireland, people traveling across to Manchester or to Glasgow. It's also from Dublin, also from any part of uh, the Republic of Ireland. What is to happen then if Brexit is carried through to the common travel area? How do you have a land border of the EU running across the island of Ireland and maintain the common travel area? Would it not mean, and some people have put it like this, it's not very nice, that there was a back door into the UK via the Republic of Ireland, not just for any European citizen, but for anybody who had entered the Republic of Ireland. I think some attention to that anybody is relevant, because it lies behind the reality that there are already coordinated border controls in the two jurisdictions, but at present those controls aren't being challenged in, by the fact of you EU citizens of mainland states having a different status in the UK and in the Republic of Ireland. At present, after all, nobody who, who was aiming to work in the UK would choose to enter via the Republic of Ireland, at least if they were travelling from the rest of Europe, but that could change. 
Now, the border. In thinking about what is feasible, I do think the nature of the border is quite important. Uh, people are often surprised to learn that it's 300 miles long, three times as long as the English-Scottish border. And it is at present very, very lightly policed, but it has twice been seriously policed since Irish independence. The first period was during the Second World War, when there was effectively zero immigration pressure on the border. The second was during the Troubles, 70s and 80s, and again, for obvious reasons, there was no immigration pressure. But it's a long border with a lot of crossings, and policing it would be a serious disruption of life and economy. Lots of people live one side, work the other side. Lots of businesses have staff on both sides. Lots of businesses are highly integrated across the border counties and beyond, particularly, by the way, the, the very important dairy industry. So I'm going to say a bit about the way that Brexit could affect the movement first of persons, <coughs> then of goods, and then of beasts. The latter matters particularly for the two Irish economies uh, because they are heavily dependent on animal husbandry, not agriculture, animal husbandry. Movement of people. The agreement is to the what, that is to say that both the Prime Minister and the teacher have said that the common travel area remains, but how is completely obscure. I heard the previous Secretary of State, Theresa Villiers, say, oh, passports in answer to that. Well, who has to show a passport for which purpose at what location? Two sorts of proposals have been discussed, both with severe difficulties. One is to have a conventional border operation with passport checks at the Northern Irish Republic of Ireland border, or alternatively on sea or air travel between Great Britain and the island of Ireland. Both would, in the first place, be massively inconvenient and time consuming. Both would require many, many people who do not have passports at all to get them and show them, and some on a daily basis. The politics of either solution would be fraught and contentious. If the current border were hardened, it could undermine much of the peace process. And if the control of persons was shifted to the Irish Sea, um, a view that some Brexiteers uh, seem to have taken rather seriously, many would see this as the expulsion of Northern Ireland from the UK. The other type of approach is to require anybody in the UK to show their identity when undertaking specified activities, taking up employment, going into hospital, taking on a lease. Now, this is something that the Conservative Party have not traditionally liked. They've been against ID cards. But it may be a cost of controlling the movement of persons without hardening the land border or writing off the peace process or excluding part of the UK. My own view is that uh, things are different now. Most people I know, including most Conservatives, carry mobile phones, which give away far more personal data about their lives than any ID card. So I do think it's a bit uh, anachronistic to be fussing about ID cards. Secondly, the movement of goods. Uh, I can say less about this because it depends so much on what agreements are reached. But I think what's very important to remember is that Brexit is not merely threatening to the UK economy, it is immensely threatening to the Republic of Ireland's economy. Um, and that it, it, it is because the EU is speaking about the tax haven approach on which so much of the prosperity of the Republic of Ireland has uh, been based, that companies headquarter there. Uh, and get low corporation tax. But President Trump has been making the same move. There is a considerable move against the tax havens, uh, you, you might say particularly Luxembourg and the Republic of Ireland, but others too. And this is particularly hard when you have manufacturing processes with components that come to and fro and to and fro across the borders as things are built up. Uh, and where sectors are particularly integrated, like dairy. I think it depends very much on the detailed outcome of negotiations what could, of what could be done. And as always, one hears some very optimistic gestures from those who believe in Brexit, however hard, and uh, they suggest that many of the controls would be invisible and no delays because they would be electronic. I have to say I have seen no details, no costings, no estimates, and 
we do have a lot of experience of cheating at, at the Republic of Ireland Northern Irish border. So let me come over to the beasts, because that's one of the areas where the cheating has been very interesting, even though there is a common agricultural support policy. Because what's very nice is once you've had your sheep counted and inspected in one jurisdiction, take them across the border and have them inspected and counted again for a second subsidy. Now, how often this happens is, of course, uh, hard to, to discover because it's all hidden in murk. But a land border of this sort is not an easy thing to please. And uh, it matters enormously because both economies are hugely uh, dependent on animal husbandry and therefore on biosecurity. And once you get differentiated agricultural support systems, I think um, that it's quite likely that people will um, do more of this, let's put it gently. Uh, it's all too easy. Now, it seems to me that you can see many, many interests in this negotiation. Um, and you can state the interests with great clarity, but what I cannot do is to discern any obvious bargain that emerges from that configuration of interests. I don't think, by the way, that the EU has entirely uh, grasped the realities of the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process in its suggestion that if there were a vote for uh, the uh, North to enter, uh, to unite in United Ireland, then there would be, uh, they would be part of the EU. It's probably constitutionally wrong to say that at this stage, but it's also wide of the mark about what the issues are. If you want to read some more about that, there's a very good blog by Paul Bew on the Policy Exchange website this week, which I recommend. Thank you. Paul Bew. Bew. Yeah.